Mortgage foreclosure is a big issue for a lot of people. There are um, a huge number of people that have suffered from uh, being foreclosed on by the bankers, and everybody knows there's something stinks about this situation, but nobody really goes deep enough to uncover the true fraud that's going on in the mortgage situations. So we all know that Wall Street bankers are greedy, and we know that bankers are greedy in general. Well, if you don't know, we're going to find out. So today we're going to do a kind of um, <clears throat> short version of uh, the process that you would go to go through if you want to fight your foreclosure. I mean, if you're not willing to fight your foreclosure and you don't believe that you have any rights, then you know, of course, you can walk away from your house, your house, and um, you know, no harm, no foul. But if you think that it, your house is worth fighting for, I'm going to show you why it's you that's been taken advantage of, not the bank. And so today we're going to um, start off with that, uh, you know, we're probably not going to get through all the information, but, you know, we're going to discuss it in detail. Uh, the very first thing to examine and try to understand is the, is the process that occurred when the alleged money was loaned to you in the first place. There are some good videos to watch on YouTube and elsewhere that discuss the aspect of money as it exists today in our society. I recommend you watching these videos. It is right here, Google Video Money Matrix. It's an hour and 10 minutes, and it's done by a CPA who discusses the fraud of the banking system. And then the next video that I recommend you watch would be Zeitgeist, the addendum, which is two hours, and it's a whole expose on the money system. You can also watch Freedom to Fascism, which is an excellent film by Aaron Russo, which discusses the IRS, the fraud of the IRS and the banking institution, the Federal Reserve. Okay. And then the third thing would be The American Dream, which is a cartoon that's about 40 minutes, and it discusses um, the issues of how it got, the money situation got to be the way it is today. And then, of course, we can always look to our favorite book, The Constitution of the United States, because all of the contractual arrangements that are made that can be, uh, you know, to, can be justified as a rule of law spring from this one book. So if you can't make the case using this book, then the, it's void. So here we are in, in Section 10, Article 1, Section 10, and it says, No state shall enter into any treaty or alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, which is what the police officers are operating under. They're actually privateers in Admiralty going out and taking prize. And coin money, so they can't issue their own coins, emit bills of credit. Now, what happens when they float a bond? Isn't that a bill of credit? Uh, make anything but gold and silver coin, gold and silver coin, a tender in the payment of debts. So in other words, if you have a debt to somebody, you can't use, under the Constitution, you can't use anything other than gold and silver coin. So what I'm going to point out to you is that <clears throat> obviously that's not the law of the land today, and we have a Federal Reserve that is issuing um, money in the form of um, uh, paper money, which is fiat currency. Um, you know, these are a gold certificate, 1915. And then we have, this is what, you know, what money looked like at one point. Payable to the bearer on demand in gold coin, right? Payable to the bearer in gold coin on demand. So if you had if you had a hundred dollar Federal Reserve note that was payable in gold coin on demand, the current rate even today is uh, forty two point two dollars in Federal Reserve notes gets you one ounce of gold. However, if you actually had an ounce of gold, it would cost you um, fourteen hundred dollars to buy it. So the um, the International Monetary Fund can raid the uh, gold supply at Fort Knox and buy gold at $42 an ounce. 
hey, can I do that? That would be that would be the way to go. So you have to understand what money is because if you don't if we don't start off the discussion, you know, discussing what real money is, then then um, it's not going to make sense why the bank doesn't have a right to take your house. So let's look at the uh, definition of money in Black's Law. Now here we have money in the act usual and ordinary acceptation. It means gold, silver, or paper money, right? However, what they meant in paper money there is you saw the paper money I was showing you before. That's paper money that's payable on demand in gold and silver. Used as circulating medium of exchange and does not embrace notes. Now, the thing that you have in your pocket that has green ink and dead presidents on it is a Federal Reserve note. It says right on there. So if it's a Federal Reserve note and you can't, and you can't call a note money, then how exactly? does the bank consider that they loaned you any money when you didn't even get uh, $500,000 worth of Federal Reserve notes delivered to you. You never got any money delivered to you. Your deed of trust says for a loan I have received and yet you never received anything. They might have put money in an escrow account on your behalf, but you never actually received anything. Okay, so the real question is how did the bank loan you any money when you know full well you nor the seller received any gold or silver or paper that could be exchanged for gold or silver. We also know that the United States Constitution states in Article 1, Section 8 and 10 that only gold and silver is lawful tender. I showed you that. So what did the bank loan you? Did the bank loan you the depositor's money? Nope. They're barred from, I mean, if you put your money in the bank, you have a right to get your money back anytime you want. Uh, if, they, if you didn't have the right to get your money back anytime you want, that would be theft, you know, unless you wanted to call it a loan to the bank and you had some kind of an agreement. But you have an agreement that you can go down and take your money out anytime you want. Now, when you sign a signature card with the bank, you never agreed to allow the bank to give your money to someone else, did you? Did they explain that to you? In fact, if the bank did loan your money to someone else, that would be theft without your approval. The bank loaned you credit, but whose credit? Did they loan you their credit? Can the bank loan the bank's credit? Let's see some uh, court case sites. So once again, we go to our favorite Black's Law. And we go, let's see. A bank may not lend its credit to another. So they didn't lend the depositors money and they can't lend their own credit, even though such a transaction turns out to have been a benefit to the bank. And in support of this, a list of cases might be cited, which would look like a catalog of ships. Norton Grocery Company versus People's Natural Bank, 144 SE 505, 155 Virginia, VA 195. And it has been settled beyond controversy that a national bank under federal law being limited in its powers and capacity cannot lend its credit by guaranteeing the debts of another. All such contracts entered into by its officers are ultra virus, which means void and unlawful. Howard and Foster Company versus Citizens National Bank of Union 133 South Carolina 202-130-SE 759, and that was from 1926. So there we go. The bank can't lend the depositors credit or money, and they can't lend their credit or money, so the only thing they could have lent you is your own credit. There's nothing to stop you from giving them a check, them honoring it, and using your own, your own credit to give you a loan. Now we see that the bank did not loan any of its depositors money, and did not loan any of their credit. So how did they come up with the cashier's check that went to the escrow account to pay the seller? Let's look at the de description of the money creation process from the Federal Reserve's own book, Modern Money Mechanics, page three. Money Mechanics, and this book was written by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And here we have You know, what makes money valuable? In the United States, neither paper currency 
nor deposits have value as commodities. Intrinsically, a dollar bill is just a piece of paper. That's a dollar bill, but a dollar is specifically defined by the 1792 Coinage Act as 371 grains of silver. Okay, here we have the Coinage Act of 1792, <clears throat> and as you can see, this is off Wikipedia. But if you look it up, you'll see that it's true. Anyway, this Coinage Act has never been repealed, and it's the Coinage Act or the Mint Act. And we see that it's the history, authorization and free coinage, and here's the definitions of what the what each thing should be. So an eagle, that's gold, would be um, 247 grains of pure, or 270 grains of standard gold. And then a dollar is, you know, one dollar is 371 and four sixteenths grains of pure, or 416 grains of standard silver. And here we have a Morgan silver dollar, and you can see this one was made in 1888. It's made in 1888. That is a silver dollar, just after the Civil War. Anyway, that's what real money looks like, I believe. Anyway, so, what then makes these instruments, checks, paper money, and coins acceptable at face value in payment for all debts and other monetary uses? See, they're the ones that are suggesting that they have some validity. Mainly, it's the confidence of the people that they have in the money system. It's the confidence that people have in the money system? No, it's not the confidence. You can't ask for gold in any contract. You're denied the right to ask to be paid in gold. So it's not the confidence, it's the fact that the government enforces it. The actual process of money creation takes place primarily in banks. Oh my god! And you thought the federal government created money. Or that, you know, the miner who uh, dragged gold out of the hillside created money. Nope, now we know it takes place primarily in banks. <laughs> And it says, these liabilities are customers' accounts. They increase when customers deposit currency and checks and when the proceeds of loans made by the banks are credited to the borrower's accounts. So the amount of money on the books increases when banks make loans to borrowers. So they make the money from thin air and the money in the bank increases when they make the loans. You don't believe that? Transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of banknotes. It was a small step from printing notes to making book entries crediting deposits of borrowers, which the borrowers in turn could spend by writing checks, thereby printing their own money. Oh my god! You just created your own money when you went down and signed the promissory note. Only they didn't actually tell you that, and they didn't give you a deposit slip. But it says right there that um, a small step from printing notes to making book entries, crediting deposits, not of checks from working, but deposits of borrowers, not deposits from bank customers deposits from borrowers. You wrote the promissory note to the bank and you deposited that and the bank deposited that promissory note and increased the amount of money in their account. Crediting deposits of borrowers. And we go up here. It all started with goldsmiths. As early bankers, they initially provided safekeeping services, making a small profit from vault storage fees for gold and coins deposited with them. People would redeem their deposit receipts whenever they wanted gold or coins. Now, they're not borrowers, they're just depositing their own money to purchase something and physically take 
the gold or coins to the seller who in turn would deposit them for safekeeping. Everyone soon found that it was a lot easier simply to use the deposit receipts directly as a means of payment. These receipts, which became known as notes, were acceptable as money. Since whoever held them could go to the banker and exchange them for metallic money. The bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving their promises to pay. In other words, they don't actually have any gold in the bank, they just gave them a piece of paper saying that they would give them money to borrowers. In this way, the banks began to create money. I'd call that fraud. Anyway. So under the Constitution, only gold and silver or paper that could be redeemed for gold and silver is common law real money. Now, wait, that's an important point because under the common law, uh, gold and silver is portable land. It's property. And the only rights you have are if you have property. If you don't have any property, the only, the only property everyone has is their body. Their body is, your body is your property. And no one can take that from you. Any other property you would have, you would have to pay for. And the only way to pay for property and own it would be to pay for it in lawful tender of what the United States Constitution considers payment and tender of a debt, gold and silver. So everything else is a reflection or imitation of money and more accurately, accurately be described a, a credit. When you buy a car, you are advanced credit and promised to pay the credit back. You get a credit card, not a money card. So can you guess whose credit was given to you? It is your own credit that is advanced to you, not the bank's credit, but your own credit. When you signed the promissory note, it, they, it was turned into a negotiable instrument and was deposited into an account and the funds were drawn from that deposit to give to the seller. Naturally, we have been trained to believe that anyone who gives their assets they worked hard for to another man is guaranteed his right to have a return of that money. After all, I mean, if you loaned Bob $1,000 and you worked hard for that money, you have a right to get that money back, right? And if he doesn't pay you, then you have a right to take collateral that he owns or some other arrangement that you contractually entered into. But you certainly have a right to get the fruit of your labor return to you. The bankers would have a right to a return of any money they lawfully acquired and loaned out, but does a man have the right to expect the return of money that was created from thin air against the U.S. Constitutional's lawful authority? Or, you know, is that counterfeit money? So let's uh, go now and read uh, the Credit River decision, which is a very interesting case. This happened in um, 1968, and it happened in Minnesota. First National Bank of Montgomery versus Jerome Daly in the Justice Court. This is a Justice, uh, justice of the Peace Township of Credit River. Martin V. Mahoney was the justice. The plaintiff, judgment, and decree. So this is uh, the judge's final ruling. The above entitled action honor before the court and a jury of 12 on December 7, 7, 1968 at 10 a.m. plaintiff appeared, that would be First National Bank, by its president, uh, excuse me, Lawrence V. Morgan and was represented by its counsel Theodore R. Mal Melby. He's representing the bank, right? Defendant appeared on his own behalf. That's Jerome Daly. A jury of talisman were impaneled and sworn to try the issues in this case. Lawrence V. Morgan was the only witness called for the plaintiff and the defendant testified as the only witness on his own behalf. So Jerome testified for himself. The plaintiff, the bank, brought this as a common law action. Now, now isn't it interesting that everywhere you hear these days, common law is a dirty word, you know, common law. And here in 1968, it's the bank that's bringing this common law action for the recovery of the possession of Lot 19, Fairview Beach, Scott County, Minnesota. The plaintiff claimed title to the real property, to the real property in question and foreclosure of a note and mortgage deed dated May 8, 1964, in which the plaintiff claimed 
was in default at the time the foreclosure proceedings were started. The defendant appeared and answered that the plaintiff created the money and credit upon its own books by bookkeeping entry. So in other words, we loaned you, you know, $20,000 and where did we get it? We just entered it into the books. Nowadays they would enter it on the computer screen, right? But basically they created the money by bookkeeping entry as the consideration. What's consideration? Money, right? Anything of value for the note and the mortgage of May 8th, 1964 and alleged failure of consideration for the mortgage deed and alleged that the sheriff's sale passed. The issues tried to the jury were whether there was a lawful consideration. I mean, if the bank created, created the money from thin air, then there's no money, right? You can't create gold and silver from thin air and whether the defendant had waived his rights to complain about the consideration. That's what estoppel is. Hey, if you don't object, like I've been saying, if you don't object, then it must be okay with you, having paid on the note for almost three years. Mr. Morgan, that's the bank president, admitted that all of the money or credit which was used as a consideration was created upon their books and that th this was standard banking practice. Now, do you think that's really changed in the 30 or 40 years? exercised by their bank in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, another private bank. And then further, that he knew of no United States statute or law that gave, that gave the plaintiff the authority to do this. In other words, there's no law in the United States that authorizes them to create money from thin air. The plaintiff further claimed that the defendant, by using the ledger book, created credit and paying on the note and mortgage waived any right to complain about the consideration. In other words, hey, you were okay with it when you came down and got the loan and bought the house, which is true, right? and that the defendant was stopped from doing so. In other words, he was barred. He can't make a, he may, he can't complain, uh, make a complaint about it later. At 12.15, the jury returned a unanimous verdict for the defendant. That would be the guy, the homeowner. Now, therefore, by virtue of the power of the authority vested in me pursuant to the Declaration of Independence, now well, there we go, Declaration of Independence is law, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which was law, and the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota not inconsistent therewith. It is hereby ordered, adjudged, and decreed, one, that the plaintiff is not entitled to recover the possession of Lot 19 Fairview Beach, Scott County, Minnesota, according to the plat thereof, on file and with the registers of deeds office. Two, that because of the failure of lawful consideration, the note and mortgage dated eight, nine, May 8, 1964 are null and void. There you go. That's the bottom line. Since they didn't give you any consideration in the contract, the contract is fraud. It's unconscionable. It has no uh, validity. Three, that the sheriff's sale on the above described premises held on June 26, 1967 is null and void and of no effect. Why? Because it's based on fraud. Four, the plaintiff had no right, title, and interest in said premises or lien thereon as above described. Five, that any provision in the Minnesota Constitution and any Minnesota statute limiting the jurisdiction of this court is repugnant. In other words, they can't claim that the court doesn't have the right to issue the orders to the Constitution of the United States and to the Bill of Rights of the Minnesota Constitution and is null and void and that this court has jurisdiction to render complete justice in this cause. Six, the defendant is awarded costs in the sum of $75 and execution is hereby issued therefore. Seven, a 10-day stay is granted. In other words, hey, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna execute this order until 10 days goes by. Because if you got an issue with it, you can put in some kind of appeal or amend it. Eight, the following memorandum is a supplemental 
memorandum made and filed in this court in support of this judgment is hereby made a part of the, by reference. And there's by the court, Justice uh, Martin V. Mahoney in his signature, Justice of the Peace. So what do we have there? We have, you know, a court case in Minnesota that shows the truth of what really is going on in America today. I mean, they can't, you can't really say that that's not what's going on. So let's, because if it wasn't going on, I mean, you've got the bank president there testifying that that's what he did. So let's look at the process you can use to keep your home when a foreclosure is looming. First, if you have, you're going to have to comprehend what stage you're at in the process of removing you from your home. At the first stage, you are still current with your alleged loan and haven't received any letters from the loan servicer that you make payments to, right? If you know you're going to be unable to continue making payments, you should start a process of debt validation now. In other words, you know, if you've lost your job or, you know, your finances are such that there's no way you're going to continue being able to make the payments, at some point you're going to get 90 days behind and they're going to issue a notice of uh, intent to foreclose. I would continue to make, to pay, to buy time to establish the record you will make by sending a the re a requirement to answer your questions about your alleged debt. The first letters I send off are of two types. The first is a QWR or qualified written request. In this document, the government statutes regulate the requirement to answer in the time the bank has to answer. The bank has 20 days under the law to acknowledge the receipt of this QWR. That's not an answer, that's just saying I got it. The bank has 60 days to answer and produce the documents you request or demand under the law. The QWR will require the bank to show proof of claim. Now there's all kinds of uh, legislation that um, applies to QWRs. It's extremely watered down and weak and there's no enforcement. There's no, you know, the, the bank doesn't suffer any losses if they completely ignore you. So that's what they do. They just ignore you. They Usually they will not answer it. But it's important to do one because at that point you have evidence that they have not been um, operating with clean hands and trying to show you, you know, that the loan was uh, legitimate. I mean, you've got them being cowardly and not answering your questions, okay? And the second letter I'd like to send off is a debt validation letter and is a form of a declaration that shows the laws that apply to the recipient bank. The bank's agents are given 21 calendar days after receipt to answer the letter or forever lose their right to answer the demand. I have yet to see a bank answer these letters and you start to wonder why after reading it over. Witnessing for yourself the lack of response in the bark's on the bank's part why they can't answer these simple questions. So I'm going to show you an example of the conditional acceptance upon proof of claim that I use. So here at the top I put in the, um, the flag at the top signifies the law of the case, right? So if I have a, a uh, 1849 California Republic flag then the law of the case is the Constitution of 1849. And it's not, um, you know, the, uh, uh, it's, it's the common law, okay? Because nowadays it's all the democracy, the de facto democracy. So here at the top we're going to name it to, and we're going to put it to the uh, CFO. I always want to address it to a, to a man or a woman, right? I don't want to address it to the uh, B of A, because B of A is a legal fiction and they can't answer anything and they can't be sent to jail. But a man or a woman can be held liable if they don't respond. So the whole point is, is that, you know, you are, I'm obligating a person to respond. So how do you find out who the CFO, CFO is? Well, get on the internet and do a little research. And if you look, you will end up finding who they are. Or get a telephone number and call them up and ask them. Record the conversation, you know, who is it that is the, C current, the current CFO of Bank of America? So you have an address, and if you can't find their name, which, you know, sometimes that happens, or you're in a rush and you can't uh, do enough research bef because you're in a time crunch, then I name them just the way I did here. So the name is CFO. So later, if, they if you come back and you do find out who that was, you, they can't say, hey, 
you didn't address it to anybody in particular. What? How many CFOs do you have? I mean, are there a dozen CFOs at Bank of America? So you got an address and a name. And then I, you know, have it, who is it from? It's from, you know, John Doe, care of, that's the separator, care of the address, you know, and you spell out California because you don't live in the fiction. And your name is in upper and lower case. It's not in all capital letters like the um, borrower on the loan, generally. So it's conditional acceptance of debt upon proof of claim. And this is a counterclaim. Why is it a counterclaim? They're the ones that are claiming that you owe them money. They're making a claim, whether it's expressed or not, that you have to send them payments, right? So you are putting a counterclaim in. And I say, I, John H. Doe, one of the people of the Republic of California. Now, right there, I've said that I'm sovereign and I'm living in uh, the Republic. And so we go down to the footnotes at the bottom so that they can read them, just so that they know what you're talking about. At the Revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people, and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects. In other words, I'm a king, but I don't have any subjects with none to govern but themselves. And that's a Supreme Court case, Chisholm versus Georgia, U.S. $2.419, and that was from um, 1793. So, and I'm in, in the Republic of, um, of California, sui juris. Sui juris um, is a statement that I'm over the age of 18 of sound mind and body, and the old, uh, uh, law dictionaries described sui juris as not a slave. So I like to use sui juris. If nothing else, it shortens up all that, you know, I'm over 18 and of sound mind. It's like capable of handling my own affairs. Sui juris, that says it all. Being duly sworn, do depose, and say. So that's the language of an affidavit. Do, you know, being duly sworn, I swear to God this is true. Do depose and say that I'm hereby presenting this conditional acceptance of debt validation upon proof of claim of debt validation for alleged account number, and then I name the, the um, bank's uh, original account number. I get the original documents that were recorded at the recorder's office. I don't want assignments and later documents. I want the originals. So you're going to go after the original documents that you signed, okay? I require you pr provide, I require proof of claim, right? I require proof of claim for any debt I'm liable for evidenced by a sworn affidavit from a party, you know, from the um, Bank of America or whatever. I name them, the, le the original lender, having direct knowledge of the debt. This is important because if they don't have direct knowledge, then it's hearsay evidence. You're going to get robo-signers, you know, that are going to lie and say that they have direct knowledge. But, you know, this is how you trap them. If you're going to get somebody who makes the claim, then you're going to have to get, you know, make him prove that he was employed at the bank and at the time and he, you know, has rental receipts from the city that he lived in and blah, blah, blah. And documents below named hereby requested to be presented. I require... Right? I require, one, a certified copy of the balance sheet showing the account hereafter named source that, the fun that funded the money that any advances of valuable consideration on behalf of John H. Doe in all capital letters originated from. Right? So, you know, if they loaned you money, it had to come from some account, right? If it came from your promissory note, then that account is going to have one deposit in it, and it's going to be your promissory note. And then down at the bottom, I, I showed the um, Black's Law definition of money. You know, it's not a note. Okay. So two, a certified copy of the balance sheet showing the account named A that the money originally came from. In other words, if, they, if the money that they gave as a cashier check um, came from them, then it would have had to come from another account, right? So I want to know the name of the account that it came from. I want to see some kind of evidence that it, ca that it came from the bank. 
that was deposited into the source account or how the source account was funded and the name of the party who advanced the money to the source account. Got to have a name, right? Three, the balance sheet showing the asset transfer from account A into, into the source account. I mean, it had to happen at a, on a certain date. You know, there had to be a deposit. An affidavit from the party having first-hand knowledge that lawful money was advanced on behalf of John H. Doe and not credit in the form of unlawful bills of credit or non-redeemable privately issued promissory notes. What's a non-redeemable privately issued promissory note? Huh? A Federal Reserve note. Can it be redeemed? It's a, it's a promise to pay. It's got the signature of two, it's got two signatures on it and it's got a date on it. Take it down to the Federal Reserve Bank and see if they'll give you anything of value for it. It's a piece of paper with green ink. A hundred dollar bill is worth something, but to them it's only worth exchanging it for other pieces of paper with green ink on it. So they will never redeem it for anything of value. I mean, you can take it to the uh, store and get a television set with it, and the store owner is going to redeem it for value, but the party who issued it, the Federal Reserve, will never redeem it for value. Under Title 12, Section 411. So you could look that up. Five, an affidavit from a party having first-hand knowledge, once again, not hearsay, swearing that Midland Funding, LLC, Citibank, Midland Credit Management Co Company, suffered a loss when John Doe did not repay the alleged money advanced on behalf of John H. Doe. All right, because once again, we read that, uh, we haven't read it yet, the issue of standing, you have to have suffered an actual loss. Six, the, the, the name position and, acknowledge of, and knowledge of agents at Midland Funding who are swearing the affidavits required above. I mean, are they the vice president? Or, you know, they're the records custodian. What position do they have at the bank? Seven, the opportunity to witness the original wet inked security instrument, deed of trust, and promissory note. So these are the things that they will never show. The original wet ink one, right, which is they're required to have that I sign. And you're not asking for them to give them to you. That would, you know, you never give away the original wet ink ones. You never give them, but you allow them to witness them, right? So to witness them that I signed that created the alleged debt. Failure to produce the original promissory note and deed of trust will be evidence of fraud in claiming any debt owing from John H. Doe or John Doe. So there you go. That, that John H. Doe in all capital letters, the straw man, or John Doe in upper and lower case, which would be you, the living man, owe any money if they don't have the, the two of them together. The lawful authority Midland Funding LLC Bank and Credit Management Incorporated had to loan anything other than gold or silver coin and expect to create a debt. In other words, under the Constitution, you just read it and you saw how in the Credit River decision they could not claim any statute or law that allowed them to create that uh, money. Nine, proof that the original contract was not unconscionable for failure to fully disclose all aspects of the agreement, failure to sign by alleged lender's agent, and failure to exchange valuable consideration. And then we go down to, I enclose the, uh, you know, the um, footnote four there, the contract information. So you look in the bottom here and it shows contract, an agreement between two or more parties. Well, if I'm going to sign it, then they have to sign it. If they don't sign it, then there's no evidence that they agreed to it, right? Both parties have to sign. Preliminary step is in making of which is offer by the one and acceptance by the other, in which minds of the parties meet. You both have to understand everything that's going on in the contract. You can't be talking about two different things. You have to be talking about the same thing. And that's another word for that is full disclosure. Both parties have to understand what they're bargaining for. And concur in understanding of terms. 
so you both understand the whole agreement. And that's Lee versus Travelers Insurance Company of Hartford, Connecticut. These are court cases, and this is out of Black's Law. Uh, fourth. And then it is an agreement creating obligation in which there must be competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration. Now it doesn't say lawful consideration. Legal means the Bar Association decided what it was. That's why, you know, when they decide that Federal Reserve notes are legal consideration. Mutuality of agreement and mutuality of obligation. Hey, you were obligated to make payments to them that you basically paid them your labor, right? I mean, you didn't get to go in the basement and get the printing press out or the photocopier out and make a bunch of pieces of paper up and give them to them. So they had to get, you had to give them your labor, but they, did they give you their labor? Or did they create the money from thin air? An agreement must not be so vague or uncertain that the terms are not ascertainable. You know, proof of compliance with the truth in lending laws of the United States Code, Title 15601, ETSEC, and Regulation Z. And then, you know, there's a, f a few more. And then we get down to the, the push. Failure to provide verified certified copies and or originals of the required documents within 21 calendar days by certified mail for verification purposes. In other words, if you don't send it certified, you know, you could have lied about when you sent it. Whereas if you send it certified, then the post office is not going to lie, right? And it's going to show when you received it. And by ar arrangement and or by arrangement to witness originals will be silent acquiescence and tacit agreement that John H. Doe or John Doe has no debt to Midland funding, you know, and that the said company is engaging in fraud by stating that they are the creditor, footnote six, and that they loaned any money and that they are entitled to any valuable consideration from John Doe or John Doe to satisfy a debt that without, that without restitution would otherwise create a pecuniary loss. Pecuniary is monetary or money, right, to them. Please take notice that this is a criminal investigation of the business practices of Midland funding, you know, and its agents officers, employees, and attorneys to determine violations of the United States criminal laws. Your claim of right in collection of a purported debt appears to be founded upon false record in violation of USC Title 18 to 2071 and 2073, falsifying records. In other words, if you can't prove that I owe you money, and you're claiming that I am, then you've obviously falsified some records. And further, claiming and possessing false allegations of counterfeit securities. Securitization of the promissory note and the deed of trust based upon falsified, that's where they sell it to Wall Street as a, a mortgage-backed security. Based upon the falsified uh, records and possession of false records and unsubstantiated claims of obligation in violation of the federal racketeer influences and corrupt organization, RICO, USC, because that's more than three people engaging in a crime, right? USC Title 18, 1961, et sec, and further, using the U.S. mail to present such fraud and false instruments amounting to mail fraud, criminal conduct filing under Title 18 U.S.C. 1341 fraud swindles laws. It's illegal to send somebody a fraudulent claim through the mail. And the, the U.S. government uses that a lot to prosecute uh, patriots because, you know, they send a um, bill of exchange or some kind of, you know, thing through the mail and then they go, you committed mail fraud. You sent a false document through the mail. Well, if you can prove that the bank doesn't have any debt owed to it and they're sending you something saying that they're going to take your home, Unless they can prove they have the right to make that claim, I'm going to call that fraud, and that's mail fraud to send that letter through the mails. And, you know, response will be sent to um, Jane Doe, notary, care of, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, who's the third party witness. And then it's going to be signed and notarized. So the notary is going to notarize your, your um, statement here. And then let's look under 15 U.S.C. 1692G, validation of debts. Collector will obtain verification of the debt, disputed debts. Debt collector shall cease collection of the debt or any disputed portion thereof until the debt collector obtains verification of the debt or a copy of the judgment. In other words, if there was a judge that ruled that you owed the money, but you know, this is not what they're doing. Collection activities and communications that do not otherwise uh, violate this subchapter may continue during the 30-day period. In other words, uh, if you file against them, then they're supposed to verify the debt. And uh, in Black's Law, the legal definition of verification is signed under oath. What they want to pass as verification is, yeah, I looked at the documents and it looks like you owe the money. Well, guess what? There's a huge difference between perjury, which would be swearing something is true, because their big fear is that you could actually prove that it wasn't. The minute you prove that it wasn't, they're going to jail. You're just making accusations. You're not, your accusations are not the same as, as, you know, I'm charging you with this or I'm sending you a bill, right? That's serious. So then we have um, the, the debt validation letter. And um, you've created the letter and it's going to get notarized. And if you can, you're best off if you can get a notary to send these letters off to the CEO or CFO of the various parties. That's the bank, the title company who's acting as trustee and the beneficiary on the original deed of trust. So you're going to need the original deed of trust. The notary does not use their stamp or license in the proof of service. That would, they would, that would get them in trouble. And they, but they will create and sign stating that they put your document, that's what a proof of service is, I put this document in a letter and sent it off certified mail with the certified mail number. And then when the bank returns any paperwork, they are to send it to the notary for verification at, the, at her, their P.O. box or address. The notary then initials the bottom of each page received so they can testify in court later to their initials. In other words, hey, if they're going to send me um, a copy of the promissory note and the deed of trust, then I just initial the bottom of each page and go, okay, this is, these are the ones I received. If I, didn't re if I didn't put initial on the bottom, then I didn't receive it. The banks will never answer the questions, so you, the party sending the debt validation letter off, will sign an affidavit of your, in your sworn testimony stating the bank did not respond to questions number, whatever they are, right? I mean, they might respond to some, but they're not going to respond to all of them. They're not going to even say that they don't apply or whatever. Okay. And, that, and then if they fail to do it, they're going to be barred and stopped from, um, legally barred from prosecuting you. Once you get the defaults, you can honestly state that the bank has refused to prove that they lent you any money. Therefore, the deed of trust is invalid, as it states in the deed of trust, all of them state, for a loan I have received, yet nowhere is the word loan described. Now, I mean, this is a huge deal because if you're going to loan your friend money, you never go, hey, I gave Bob a loan. I expect him to pay me back. Wow. No, you go, I... John Doe loaned Bob Bro uh, $1,500 on such and such date, and he's going to pay me back um, $100 a month until it's paid off with an interest rate of 5% per annum, or whatever, right? This is what you're going to say. But nobody ever says in a bill, you know, you, know, you don't do a bill of sale that, you know, I'm giving my Honda to, to Bob Bro. No, you better describe it a little better than that my Honda license number, whatever, right? Or my 1989 Honda license number, whatever. On this date, for this much money, paid in full. So you better, you, and if you think banks don't know how to write a contract up, I mean, these guys have lawyers. They pay lots of money to write this stuff up. So you can be sure that the reason they don't describe what the loan was is so that they can avoid uh, being sued for fraud because they never actually loaned you any money. They're not the true lender. So um, then you would um, 
get certified copies of the original deed of trust from the county recorder's office. And when I mean original, if you signed up uh, the loan you're working on at is current, you know, whatever the loan you're working on now was in 2002 or whatever, you go down and um, let's say they filed a bunch of assignments or they changed the trustee or they did anything else. It doesn't really matter. You go back for the original. Now, if you refinance the house and they paid off the uh, 2002, then you could go with the one that, you know, is currently the big, you know, the big uh, loan that is the most recent. But it has to be you're going after the person that you allegedly owe the money to. So you get the certified copy, right? And you'll have a stamp made in red ink that will be put on each page of the certified copy of the deed of trust. Under the law, you can cancel any contract for fraud, and since the bank has not proven its claim, it lent you money from the deed, contract was fraud. If you don't make a claim, you cannot get any rights. So you must put on paper and give common law notice and grace. In other words, constructive notice and a certain amount of time, that would be grace, to respond to it. Or you lose the right to respond. Now let's look at the second letter that you would send off with the, um, with the, um, this process. You're going to give them three chances to respond. So once again, we're going to have the uh, flag at the top, and we're going to name it to this, you know, send it to the same people and whatnot. And then you have the notice of fault and opportunity to cure. So I'm st stating that you're in dishonor because you haven't answered the letter yet, and I'm just giving you a wakey wakey call that, um, you know, basically, once again, I'm John Doe, one of the people of the Republic of California, sui juris, being duly sworn and deposed, say that I am hereby presenting this notice of fault and opportunity to cure for alleged account number, you know, such and such, on whatever the date was that you sent it off, right, you know, I had my notary, or maybe it's, you're in a, you know, your person who's going to swear for you that, that they didn't respond adequately, or do your proof of service is your friend down you know your friend down the street somebody with a different address from you you know if you can't find a notary to do this notary is best but if you can't find a notary somebody not you not a party to the case who's not going to lie about it is going to do the uh, proof of services and sent the above named party the above named party that would be this guy right sent the above named party a conditional acceptance of debt upon proof of claim of debt validation dated such and such so you know you know wh when was the letter the first letter you sent off sent by certified mail number you're going to fill that in and it stated in part right failure to provide verified copies and originals and then you just copy and paste your um, statement stating that they have so much time neither I nor my notary or in this case your friend the third party witness your friend has received a response that meets the conditions required by the conditional acceptance and therefore said party is in dishonor all right you sent you sent them a, a notice and they're in dishonor for not honoring you know your request and the time to cure your dishonor by adequately responding is about to expire this notice is a courtesy to give the above noted addressee the opportunity to cure their dishonor so you're going to get this notarized, right? And then the last one you're going to send off is the final notice, right? So here we go, the notice of final default default and notice of estoppel slash estoppel. And here we go, you know, once again, I, you just go through the list and you say, I sent you the original on such and such a date certified mail number, and I sent you the notice of opportunity to cure on such and such a date number. And because you didn't answer them in the 21 days has expired, uh, you know, you're hereby stopped and barred by Neil Dissett acquiescence and latches from claiming a debt owed to it by John Doe or John Doe and is barred from taking any lawful or legal action against John Doe or John Doe for collection of the alleged debt claiming to, claiming to be the creditor. 
Now when we go down here, we start looking at the, um, here's Neil Dissett. The uh, judgment is, he says nothing. This is the name of the judgment which must be taken as a course against a defendant who omits to, omits to pleading or answering the defendant's declaration or complaint within the time limited. You gave him 21 days, which is the standard time to answer a counterclaim. In some jurisdiction, is otherwise known as judgment for want of a plea. And this is from a court case in Texas, and this is out of Black's Law Fourth. And then acquiescence. Acquiescence and latches are cognate but not equivalent terms. The former is a submission to or resting satisfied with. In other words, if you're going to acquiesce to something, it's like, hey, you know, I'd like you know you not to do anything against me, and uh, you and you don't say anything, right? Then I guess you're okay with it. In the existing state of thing, while latches implies a neglect to do that which the party ought to do for his own benefit or protection, hence latches may be evidence of acquiescence. Latches imparts a merely passive assent, while acquiescence implies active assent. In other words, I told you and you didn't do anything. So, and then we have latches, a stop will buy, a failure to do something which should be done to claim or enforce a right. Now the bank should be enforcing a right by making a claim, right? At a proper time. So, there you go. A neglect to do something which should, which one should do or to seek to enforce a right at a proper time. So that's latches. So there you go. The bank would be um, losing its opportunity. Now here's an example of, this is a, a deed of, um, a note, promissory note that somebody got from the bank and, sh and you know, gave them a, a true copy after the fact, right? And look at what they added to the note. You see, you, when you signed your promissory note or when you get a copy of it, you will never see anything like this on it. But this is what they do to it. Pay to the order of so-and-so without recourse, Bank of America N.A. by William, C William, whatever, Craig, Assistant Vice President. And you see, when you add that to it, this makes this note a negotiable instrument. Pay to the bearer, right? Pay to the order of. So you could fill that in, and if it's, a, if it's an endorsement in blank like this where there's no name put in, anybody that has it can add the name, and then it becomes like money. So when they deposit it or when they sell it, they endorse it like this, and they turn it into a negotiable instrument. So now let's look at a few other cases where, you know, this is a... U.S. District Court Judge Thomas Rose uh, in the United States District Court of Southern, uh, Southern District of Ohio in re-foreclosure cases, and then there's like 17 cases here or something like that. Opinion and order. And then we're going to go down to here where we're going to read it. And this is what the judge is saying, right? To satisfy Article Three standing requirements. See, I make a big deal about standing. 